give you credit. He's probably not speaking to the scores and scores of evangelical ministries already actively involved in community outreaches through numerous methods. What is clear is that Barbados seems on a heavy cloud of economic uncertainty that leaves the people with a sense of insecurity and in many cases a sense of hopelessness. National leadership is perceived to be uninterested, uncaring, and incapable of stemming the rapid decline of national stability. Added to all this, this political institution, now celebrating its 73rd anniversary, has been jolted by internal conflict and disturbance that threaten the very unity of the Barbados Labour Party. What seems apparent is that we are in need of a leader. I did, not, I did not say simply a Prime Minister or Minister of Economic Affairs. I said a leader. It, it seems as if this nation is crying out for a father figure who will say to us as a country, everything is going to be all right and actually get the people to believe. William Arthur, one of America's most quoted writers of inspirational maxims said, and I quote, the mediocre teacher tells, the good teacher explains, the superior teacher demonstrates, but the great teacher inspires, end of quote. We need someone to inspire us. And let me be quick to add, this is not a political message. <laughs> the scriptures make it clear that in order to overcome the obstacles that face groups of any kind, a strong commitment to unity is essential. And it is this unity that will be opposed as forces of a spiritual nature seek to destabilize this great country through various devious means. There is a fear created and maintained through the constant reference to global conditions suggesting that the walls are ruined and we have no protection against the Sambalats and Tobias. It is clear then that with all these forces arrayed against our country, why you have chosen to celebrate this conference under the theme Rescue, Rebuild and Restore. Let us therefore take a look at how we rescue the nation. It was a similar environment of exposure, discouragement, and hopelessness that Nehemiah found himself drawn by the news of the exposed city of Jerusalem, lying its walls in ruin. This not only proved an embarrassment to the people of Israel, but it also exposed them to the threat of external influences. Walls speak of security, boundaries, an enclosure of safety, a sense of comfort, of ownership, of separation. To rescue means to save from a distressing and dangerous situation. Smith's Bible Dictionary, in speaking concerning the book of Nehemiah, says, Nehemiah's great work was rebuilding for the first time since their destruction by Nebuchadnezzar, the walls of Jerusalem and restoring that city to its former state and dignity as a fortified town. To this great objective, therefore, Nehemiah directed his whole energies without an hour's unnecessary delay. In a wonderfully short time, the walls seemed to emerge from the heaps of burnt rubbish to encircle the city as in the days of old. It soon became apparent how wisely Nehemiah had acted in hastening on the work. On his very first arrival as governor, Sambalat and Tobiah had given unequivocal proof of their mortification of his appointment. But when the restoration was seen to be rapidly progressing, their indignation knew no bounds. They made a great conspiracy to fall upon the builders with an armed force and put a stop to the undertaking. The project was defeated by the vigilance and prudence of Nehemiah. Various stratagems were then resorted to to get Nehemiah away from Jerusalem and, if possible, to take his life. But that which most nearly succeeded 
was the attempt to bring him into suspicion with the king of Persia. As if he intended to set himself up as an independent king as soon as the walls were completed. The artful letter of Sambalat so far wrought upon Artaxerxes that he issued a decree stopping the work and further orders. It is probable that at the same time he recalled Nehemiah. Or perhaps Nehemiah's leave of absence was previously, as previously granted, had expired. But after delay, perhaps for several years, he was permitted to return to Jerusalem. He, lay, he landed to crumble his work by repairing the temple and dedicating the wall. During his government, Nehemiah firmly repressed the exactions of the nobles and the earthquery of the rich and rescued the poor Jews from spoliation and slavery. He refused to receive his lawful allowance as governor from the people in consideration of their poverty during the whole 12 years that he was in office. But he kept at his own charge a table of 150 Jews at which anyone who returned from captivity were welcome. End of my book. So years before it was conceptualized within our shores, the practice of the politics of inclusion was actively engaged. But there was a fundamental reason for the successful campaign led by Nehemiah, without which he would never have achieved the, the completion of the monumental task that lay before him. And so, I draw your attention to two key verses in this book of hope that provided the key impetus for their achievement as Nehemiah set about to rescue his nation's pride and dignity. In chapter 4 and verse 6 of Nehemiah, and in chapter 6 and verse 15, the scripture says, So we built the wall, and the whole wall was joined together to have its height, for the people had a mind to work. So the wall was completed on the 25th of the month Elul in 52 days. But it was not without opposition and conflict as the enemies of the project used a variety of methods in an attempt, as it were, to throw a spanner in the works. First, they said the walls were nothing, even a fox could bring them down. And then they tried to sow seeds of division among the ranks of the Jews in an attempt to derail the world. And, and then they threatened to kill them as they were, a more direct approach. How things have not changed, huh? And finally, they tried to turn the king against Nehemiah and his work, but even that he overcame. But the key lay in the fact that the people had a mind to work. Our country is at a crossroads. It cannot be business as usual. Neither can we afford to play party politics as in the past. Neither can we afford to once again become slaves to international monetary organizations. There is a demand for a new approach to the business of governance and leadership. But what is desperately needed is someone who will inspire this country to a place where the people all have the same mind. A mind to produce. A mind to work. It demands all hands on deck. The politics of partisanship has no place either in the current or future existence of this country. Barbados does not belong to the Democratic Labour Party. Barbados does not belong to the Barbados Labour Party. It belongs to the Lord. Psalm 24 verse 1 tells us the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Psalm 100 verse 3 tells it is He who has made us and not we ourselves. We are His people and the sheep of His pasture. And he has loaned this rock to the people of Barbados, whose great forefathers sowed the seed from which our pride is sprung, whether be or be. A rescue mission must be strategized for our country to restore itself to its former glory and to save it from the hands of an uncaring institutional agencies, both international and local, who act in a most high-handed manner at a time when Barbadians have found their walls destroyed and their financial lands decimated and exposed. While there are those who 
constantly point to the global conditions that exist as the causality of our economic stagnation, there are other countries such as Canada that have not felt the impact of any global recession, real or imagined, if one knows and understands how the system works, find out how they have done it. Now to restore, and I'm going to stay in, in, in the track and trend of my heart and call, even though your thing says rescue, rebuild, restore, I'm going to stay with what I, I had before, and I'm not going to shift it because I have to see what God has put in my heart. To restore means to return to a former condition, to a former place or position, to repair or to renovate so as to return the thing to its original condition. So if the people's perspective is correct, a rescue mission must be mounted just as Nehemiah initiated in his day in order to return our country to the place of dignity, security and respect, both regionally and globally. It will demand leadership by example. Don't ask the people to do what you are not prepared to do yourself. The next matter to engage is that of restoration. Chapter 5 and verse 15 of the same book of Nehemiah reveals that the previous administration levied heavy taxes on the people and took from them their very basic necessities. You must find ways to relieve the people of their heavy burdens. One may consider the removal of income tax, a concept that may well be worthy of consideration. For one knows that when people have more, they spend more and the economy grows. There is therefore a need to restore consumer confidence. What I am simply saying is that you need to become innovative and creative and not remain within the safety zones due to past experience. The future belongs to the innovators, not those who toe the line and do the same things. Indeed, the definition of insanity has been defined as one who does the same thing the same way and expects different results. And God will remember you for the good you do for the people. Restore the politics of inclusion. For as a country, we need not simply the best brains, but the best people. Many of whom excel not necessarily in academia, but in values, morals, and strong belief systems. Values flow from what we believe. And as Christians, we have the greatest value system on earth. I challenge you to return our independent service to the church and consider rather a multi-faith celebration for our Emancipation Day, bringing greater significance and national recognition to this most important event in our country's history that has impacted all of our people, regardless of nationality or religious belief. Remain focused on the task at hand. Nehemiah told his detractors that he had no time to waste in trivial and irrelevant matters. Nehemiah chapter 6 and verse 10 through 12 warns us that we should also be equally careful whose advice we follow. Ask God for a spirit of discernment. God will show the way. In chapter 7, we are encouraged to reward persons who have been faithful and reliable to their commitment. Trust what God has put in your heart. Know your nation's resources. Put God first. Put God first. I make no apologies in saying this. Around us we see countries that have been compromising for the sake of meeting the requests of persons who want to live a lifestyle of values that are simply not either socially acceptable or divinely ordained. And as a country, we must put it first. The scripture is clear. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. And this country, I don't care who, has what to say, has been built on Christian principles, and on that it must remain. Put in first nationally, but most importantly, personally. And not just what you conceive him to be, he has shown himself how he wishes 
and provided for our personal relationship with Him through Jesus Christ. Let us commit to no more religious games. I apologize for the behavior and actions of some of my fellow ministers. And trust me, if I had the ways and means, some of them wouldn't be in the pulpit. And I apologize for those. I apologize to you for those who in recent months have sought to project a completely different perspective of fundamental values and principles which we as Christians and as people have known have existed for years. I have always been warned, don't remove offense until you know why it was built in the first place. Find moral, sound, honest, spiritually relevant people to lead. No more political lackeys. Do not compromise here regardless of how the world around you functions. Our country simply cannot afford such removal of our fundamental values and beliefs as we have witnessed in other nations. And let me once and for all dismiss the fallacy of the separation of church and state. If you understand who or what the church really is, you will understand how this becomes impossible. And furthermore, it was never intended to disqualify the church from national contribution, but to stop the state interfering with the spiritual choices of people. How in the world can you have a social partnership at the exclusion of the largest social entity in the country with possibly the greatest influence? You want to find out how influential we are? Let me stand in my pulpit and tell my people what to do. Put us on the bargaining table with all parties concerned. We're not just spiritual. Jesus never was just spiritual. And spiritual things only have value as they are capable of being manifested in the natural. And he's still teaching us how to engage economic and social issues. That work has never ended. The church has its fingers on the pulse of the people, trust me. Enforce the legislation that is in ways to protect the religious rights of worship for the people, many of whom are finding themselves forced into Sunday servitude by their employers. Constitutional councils can work, but will best function when they're under the leadership of the people, not the minister. Put the necessary legislation in place and establish parameters of operation with accountability demanded and under the oversight of financial management of government. And what would be the result of this restoration? Well, chapter 12, verse 43 and 44, and I must tell you, this is the shortest message I've ever preached. <laughs> but I respect that I'm under authority this morning, and so I have to pull in the reins. And on that day they offered great sacrifices and rejoiced because God had given them great joy. Even the women and the, and the children rejoiced. So the joy of Jerusalem was heard from afar. On that day, men also pointed over the chambers for the stores and contributions, the first fruits and the tithes, to gather them in from the fields of the cities and portions required by the law for the priests and the Levites. For Judah rejoiced over the priests and the Levites who served. The nation's pride and dignity was rebuilt. It resulted in great national economic restoration, joy, and security. And the people were pleased. All of the people. And so the walls were rebuilt. In spite of opposition, in spite of detractors, the job was complete. The walls were rebuilt in record time. The same is demanded of us today. And the thing is possible. This conference is not about the BLP. This conference is about this nation. It is not spelled B L P. It is spelled B A R B A D O. In another two years. Elections will be constitutionally due in Barbados. You may say so, but I cannot possibly comment. It is up to you. Are you listening to me? 
if there's one thing you must never take for granted, is the opportunity God gives to lead a country. It must never be taken for granted. The power exists, is in his hands, to give to whosoever he feels. Don't think for a moment that just because things is the way they are, that you have a right. You better make sure that you are in line with what God requires so that you qualify at the time he decides to retain the positions of God. It is up to you to convince the people of this country that you are capable of giving the type of leadership that will rescue the nation from the doldrums of economic inactivity, restore the country to its former glory, and rebuild the confidence and assurance that seems to have been lost. God bless you all, and God bless our great nation of our Thank you.